In the name of accuracy, the award is called the Myron Berger Award, uh, named for Myron Berger, who went by the name uh, Mike, who was a longtime reporter for the New York Times, who also put some time uh, at the New Yorker. In his obituary in 1961 in the New York Times, the Times called him the master of the human interest story. And this award goes for an outstanding work of in-depth human interest reporting. Uh, Berger uh, was more than a human interest reporter. He was a uh, dogged reporter, an assiduous scholar of the human condition, and a beautiful prose stylist. Now, by tradition, the presentation of this award calls for the telling of the tale of the story that earned um, Mike Berger a Pulitzer Prize in 1949. There was um, a serial killer in Camden, New Jersey, who went on a killing spree and killed 13 people. On the day of his arrest, uh, Mike Berger made his way from New York to Camden and in one day interviewed 50 people who were connected to the events. He went back to his office in New York, sat down at his typewriter, and in two and a half hours wrote a 4,000 word masterpiece that detailed, there was a detailed retracing of the steps. That is to say that uh, he wrote a master's project in, <laughs> in 24 hours. So if you, if you learn from that, imagine how much time you'd have to hang out. Uh, <laughs> The, the award uh, in Mike Berner's honor goes this year to Ken Armstrong and T. Christian Miller for a piece called An Unbelievable Story of Rape that was an account of a young woman wrongfully accused of sexual assault. Armstrong was working uh, for the Marshall Project and Miller for ProPublica. They were working independently and found that the other was working on the same story. They teamed up and they wrote a, a, a gorgeous uh, exquisitely detailed and profoundly moving uh, piece about police practices, good and bad, and uh, the story of a survivor who was finally exonerated. I'd like to bring up Ken Armstrong and T. Christian Miller. Thank you, David, for those kind words. Um, last year, in August, I received an email from my boss at the Marshall Project, uh, Bill Keller. The email's first sentence, the one you can see on your inbox screen before you even open the email, had only two words. The two words were, oh, crap. <laughs> only the second word wasn't crap. It was another four-letter word. <laughs> now, Bill's an editor, and editors swear, the good ones anyway. But still, as opening lines go, this one was a bit worrisome. Then I read his email and I understood. Bill had just learned from Joe Sexton, an editor at ProPublica, that ProPublica was chasing the same story that I had been working on for months. This story took place in two states. I had been working on it in Washington with plans to go later to Colorado. T. Miller, a reporter with ProPublica, had been working on the story in Colorado with plans to go later to Washington. Well, T. crossed state lines first and discovered he had competition. And that's when something unusual happened. ProPublica could have torpedoed us by streamlining their reporting and taking whatever shortcuts were necessary to beat us into print. Instead, they reached out to us and asked if we wanted to work together. And I am so glad and so grateful that they did. Instead of competing, we collaborated. Instead of diminishing the story by rushing it into print, we elevated it by pooling our talents. We went from, oh crap, to, oh yeah, this, this is better. And in a way, that idea, this is better, became our guiding principle on this story, which broke with convention in so many ways. Here we had two nonprofits producing a story that appeared nowhere on paper, only digitally, while partnering with a radio program, This American Life. All three partners understood 
that it was more important to get the story right than to get it first or to get it alone. The story had no lead writer. T and I each wrote half and locked the pieces together. There was no resistance to being edited, something reporters can be known for. Um, at the story's outset, Joe Sexton, uh, an editor at ProPublica, came up with the structure in what I imagine is some kind of fever dream. And at story's end, after the story had been edited and polished and presumably finished, another editor came in and proposed some changes to the top. Her suggestions were so spot on, T and I asked her to keep going. We told her, and we actually said this, we would like more editing, please. <laughs> that editor, Kirsten Danis, was 25 years ago a student here at Columbia, where she was editor of The Spectator. So a hat tip to your wonderful university. As reporters, T and I are both, shall we say, seasoned. Um, I'd call us grizzled, except grizzled makes me think of gray hair, and T, um, <laughs> um, T has covered four wars um, in Kosovo, Colombia, Israel, and Iraq. I've worked at newspapers in eight different states. Along the way, I think we've both come to appreciate the need in journalism to adapt and to grow. If I can speak personally, I can tell you that a story like this, a story with emotion and nuance and so much gray, would have been difficult for me to report and write 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was sure of myself and sure of others. But as I've gotten older, I've become slower to judge for an omission. Now, I'm more inclined to listen. My questions are shorter and people's answers are longer. I'm not in such a hurry anymore. Um, if you think of the seven heavenly virtues, which is the one least associated with journalism, aside from maybe temperance? <laughs> it's patience. We are an impatient lot, reporters. But sometimes people need time to collect. That's true if they've been harmed. That's true if they've done harm. Our story centered on Marie, a young woman victimized twice over. She was raped, then charged with making the story up. It took seven months of emails and phone calls before Marie agreed to be interviewed for our story, but she did agree because she understood that by sharing her story, painful as it was, she could help others. Marie's two foster moms, who to their regret did not believe Marie, and the lead detective who accused her of lying also agreed to be interviewed. They understood that by sharing their mistakes, painful as they were, they too could help others. When I was younger, I saw people's weaknesses. Now I look for and appreciate their strengths. I've come to realize that when we write about people in full, our stories are more interesting. They're also more true. Thank you.